Okay, I think we've got a pretty good critical <laughs> mass here. Going to go ahead and start. So, once again, good morning. Thank you for joining us on today's webinar, How to Build a Strong Work Culture and Drive Digital Transformation. My name is Nicole. I'll be your moderator. And now, of course, I want to introduce you to our panelists, which is really why we're all here today. So joining us is Chuck Blakeman, Dan Morris, and Osamu Yamada. So welcome, everyone. And now I'm going to introduce you each one by one of why they're here. Uh, Chuck Blakeman, he's a successful entrepreneur, a best-selling business author, and world-renowned uh, business advisor who built 10 businesses in seven industries on four continents. And now he's using his experience to advise others. His company, Cranksit Group, provides outcome-based mentoring and peer advisory for business leaders worldwide. Then we've got Dan Morris. He is the co-author of five books on business process transformation, a columnist for PEX, and the author of numerous white papers on business transformation and digital transformation topics. He has spoken internationally at over 40 conferences and serves on the directors for the Association of Business Process Management Professionals. And then we have Osamu Yamada. He is the Vice President of Saibozu, the number one collaboration and office solution provider in Japan, and CEO of San Francisco-based Kintone, a leading application platform as a service. An internationally recognized expert on progressive company culture, he's led innovative discussions on IT and the future of work at Gartner, Harvard, Bu Harvard Business Review, and other venues. So before we get started, just want to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You should see your attendee interface on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're currently most likely listening in using your computer speaker system by default, but if you prefer to join over phone or have trouble hearing from your computer, you can just select telephone and that's in the audio pane and the dial information uh, will be displayed. So you'll have opportunities to submit text questions to our presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collect those and we'll address them during our Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So let's go ahead and dive into our topic for today. There's a lot of talk around the industrial age and now how we're moving into the participation age. Many companies still using industrial age management practices are struggling with digital transformation. Business practices that have existed for decades are just no longer effective. In the participation age, people want engaging work and to make decisions on their own. The culture of organization determines how a business grows and transforms. And of course, technology decisions for the organization goes hand in hand with building a siloless and collaborative working culture. So according to Forrester's recent report, Sustain a Digital Culture, the most digitally aware enterprise leaders are realizing that cultural and organizational transformation will dominate their agenda for years to come. Now, a lot of cultural issues are at the root of many failed business transformations, yet most organizations don't assign explicit responsibility for culture. So to reap the benefits of digital business, leaders must take a culture-first approach to business transformation, and that's according to a research director at Gartner. All right, so some goals and what we'll be covering in this webinar. We're going to identify barriers to change in an organization and its impact on the adoption of technology. We're going to learn some tips from going from control and bureaucracy to agility and innovation. And then we're going to create a cultural change roadmap and a stewardship of digital transformation for stakeholders. So before we dive into our panel discussion with our fantastic presenters here, we're just going to do a brief poll. I'm going to go ahead and launch that. You should see it popping up on your screen. So the question is, how well do your teams collaborate across department functions? Now, this is totally anonymous. So go ahead and answer, and uh, we'll review in just a moment here. All 
All right, the votes are coming in. So far, looks like the majority of people are saying, good enough, but could do better. We've got a couple average that need some work. One or two saying, excellent. That's why our company does so well. All right, interesting. So a lot of people are saying, good enough. Um, but could do better. That ended up being the overarching poll. I'll give you guys just a few more seconds to, to vote if you haven't already. All right. Thank you to everyone who participated. So McKinsey analysis has shown that digital leaders place a premium on internal collaboration, creating processes and teams that integrate various functions across the business and developing incentives for sharing. We've seen a lot of companies succeed by building a cross-functional team that brings together key people for marketing, sales, product development, and IT for specific projects. So this is a perfect transition into our panel discussion. And we're going to start the conversation discussing how business transformation starts with culture. So this first question is for Chuck. Chuck, why does cultural change leadership matter now more than ever? Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And I'm going to ask where you got that really bad picture of me, but that's okay. <laughs> How stuffy you are. look great. It's a great <laughs> Cultural change leadership really matters now more than ever. It's always mattered. But I think for 200 years, we what we did in the, in the industrial age was not neutral. It was really great for the stuff. We, we, we got incredible stuff out of the industrial age, but we, we, it was wrong for people. It dehumanized them. And uh, we want to rehumanize the workforce and give everybody their brains back. Uh, the industrial age did just the opposite. It gave us great toys, but, uh, but in terms of the humanity, it, uh, it, it's really a pimple on the face of business. So we need some clear cell to get past it. The, 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 the clear cell in my mind is great leadership, focused on giving everybody their brains back and and learning that uh, if we take care of the people, there's so much new research on this that when we take care of the people, they take care of the businesses, the clients, and the processes. So cultural change, uh, culture is, is one of those uh, fuzzy things that doesn't need to be so fuzzy, and I think it's time to, to give it its rightful place in developing an organizational structure. I would also mention that Deloitte University did, to support your statistics, Deloitte University did a uh, bit of research and found that 92% of the companies they surveyed want to change their organization, organizational structure this year. They just don't know how to do it. And culture, <laughs> I think, is a big piece of that. And so what are you seeing happening at a lot of traditional companies? And why, why change now? Yeah, because 95% uh, of them are still stuck in the industrial age. We think the industrial age was over in the 70s. You know, the production area has moved on from smokestacks and assembly lines to things like clean rooms and, technology, and nanotechnology. But the front office looks pretty much the same way it did in 1910, with guys and ties making decisions for everybody else. Uh, the command and control top-down hierarchy imposing tasks instead of delegating responsibilities. And worst of all, managing people. It's an industrial age concept, managing people. We, we, people don't need to be managed. They need to be led. And these are two very different things. Stuff needs to be managed. And in the industrial age, people became stuff. They became extensions of machines. Mm -hmm. Stuff mm -hmm. is truly stupid and lazy, but people aren't. So we need, to, we need to move on from that. The state of most current organizations is they're still treating people like stuff. That's where the emerging work world has to come in to, to change this. And the good news is there's hundreds of large companies and really thousands of smaller ones that are leading the way out of all this. And the data is all on the side of giving people their brains back and, and uh, changing the way we, we organize. Excellent. And, you know, I think Saibozu really uh, aligned with a lot of what you're saying. So I want to ask Osamu, what led Saibozu to change its company culture in the last decade? Yes, so we created the human resources system with 100 types of work styles for 100 people because each individual is unique. Uh, one size fits all HR approach does not work anymore. Companies need to adapt to the, 
adapt to, to uh, today's global and digital business environment, and that means adapting to their employees' unique needs. If not, then face their consequences. We did 11 years ago when employee turnover rate at CyberZoo reached 28%. That means two or three members got out from our company at every single month. You know, one uh, one people so my baby every once one one week and two weeks. So so we have a farewell party. So can you imagine that situation? I didn't want to get it. So we had to start asking who we want to be and what kind of company we are, was putting all of our resources into becoming the biggest company in the market or in the world really worth it? And would that thinking help us in the long run? We were feeling the uh, impacts of losing a lot of great employees that we trust and enjoy working with. Our goal to grow faster and faster as a company, so people people working hard, so hard, but that was hurting us, and that was tragedy. So we knew we had to make a big change, and we did it. After a few years of uh, restructuring, we managed to bring their turnover rate down to 4%. Wow, so that's a pretty big change. Um, what did Cybozo leadership do to get to that point? Yes, well, so we decided to focus on our employees and uh, researching what we could do to make them happier. We started with a leave system that guaranteed jobs for six years, not just for parents taking care of their kids, but for employees needing to nurture their careers outside, outside of cybers. We also created highly flexible working hours and generous amounts of remote work. We quickly realized that it's not beneficial to require everyone to show up at the same time at the same place. This one-size-fits-all approach is not good for employees. It's beneficial for a manager to manage employees, to manage organization easier. It's, import it's more important that people fit in our culture and truly feel like we are aligned on mission on and goals to build great things. It requires a focus on the employee and working with each person's unique needs. That's why we created the concept of 100 work styles for 100 people. Focus on what they need to happy and uh, help them do their best work. Okay, and just one last question about what kind of impact Ibozu saw after implementing these new HR policies. Okay, so we noticed a sharp increase in employee motivation and productivity, but it took a couple years. If you look at the chart, you'll see what happened. At first, turnover rate was lowering, but sales stayed the same. After six years, we introduced cloud service, which included uh, Kintom, uh, and our sales took off. But it probably wouldn't have grown so fast if it wasn't for focusing on turnover rates and building a strong work culture years earlier. I wouldn't say there is a strong relation between turnover rate and economic growth, but it happens to us, that is the reality. Our mission also changed it. We are now focused on making teamwork better around the world, and that of course includes our own team as well. We don't think it is very important to be the capital market winner, but we cannot be the loser. Otherwise, we cannot fulfill our mission of providing excellent teamwork. Make teamwork better, and as a result, we make society better. We want to do good things in the world, not just raise our market cap.
Thanks, Osamu. And Chuck, really curious. I know Cranksit Group has a lot of really progressive, interesting um, approaches to creating a flexible work culture. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Nicole, we, uh, my perspective is really you don't build a culture. You simply live out what you believe. And that's how we built Cranksit Group. It, it's, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing. Uh, for us, the, uh, uh, the, the chicken is, is our, you know, let's say the chicken came first, the chicken is our beliefs. What do we believe uh, determines everything that we become and our culture is a direct relationship to that. So we have some basic fundamental things we believe about, for instance, uh, <clears throat> why business exists. Is business war or is business uh, do you exist to contribute? Uh, why our particular business exists, to add value or to destroy the competition? Uh, why leadership exists? Does leadership exist to serve or does it exist to command and control? And then uh, things like why, uh, why people come to work. Do they come to work to make money or to make meaning? Uh, why, what defines success? Is success from just profit alone or is it uh, profit with contribution? And, and maybe one of our biggest ones, one of our biggest belief systems is we believe people are smart and motivated. And the industrial age assumed that people were, uh, Frederick Taylor in 1911 wrote a paper called Scientific Management. And in that paper he defined the employee as stupid and lazy. The average employee is so stupid they more resemble the ox than any other type of the quote from the book. So we don't believe that. We believe people are, are for the most part, uh, smart and motivated. We built our culture around the assumptions that our business exists to contribute, that people come to work to make meaning, and that they are smart and motivated. And uh, when, we, when we have that belief system, that's the way we make decisions. And it's, a, it's sort of a, 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 a descending train, if you will. If we believe this, then we, we think this. And if we think that, then we decide this way. And we would decide that way. We decide that way often enough. That becomes our habits. And that becomes our culture, and that becomes our destiny. So all of that cultural stuff comes from what I believe and what the leadership of this company believes. It's, it's that, uh, that, that's the core of everything that we have to do culturally. What do we believe? Hmm. So it, it sounds very conceptual, like you said, the kind of chicken and egg problem there. But still, it remains very hard for companies to morph into flexible work culture. So really interested in... Um, Osama and Chuck, your answers on this. Maybe Chuck first, since we left off. Why is it so hard for companies to create flexible work cultures? And you said not build, but maybe morph is the better word for that. Right. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the clever answer is it's actually not. It's really incredibly easy to change the culture. All you have to do is change out the leadership and get somebody in who believes the right things about the business. That's the hard part. If you have leadership in place who, who, who does not understand the, the, the value and hasn't yet seen how much more productive, how much more uh, revenue, uh, uh, profitability, productivity, uh, lower turnover, if they haven't seen all this stuff, then it's very difficult for them to see the value of changing their culture. It's working well enough right now and leave it alone because what I what we're going to do it might be worse. So it's really very easy to change the culture, but only if the leadership believes that, and that's the key. The leadership tends not to believe that people are as smart and motivated as I am, uh, and all the other things that come with that. There's a trust factor that they haven't yet seen when they set people free, they rehumanize the workplace, give everybody their brains back. It scares them to death because they think of that as chaos and anarchy and all the other things that might come from that image when, in fact, the self-managed companies that I'm aware of, the hundreds of large ones and thousands of small ones, they're more organized. They have uh, uh, better processes. They have exponentially lower turnover, as uh, Osamu was, was mentioning. Uh, all the data is on that side, but the emotion uh, is on the side of let's keep things the way they are, and there's there's just a lack of experience. As more companies do this, and more companies show the data, it'll be easier for other companies to get on board. But it's a belief system issue. Okay, thank you. And Dan, we're going to get to you in just a moment here, but I wanted to get Osamu um, your thoughts on this, on why it's so hard to create 
or morph into a flexible work culture. Okay. Um, I totally agree with you know, Chuck. <laughs> so great. <laughs> I think so. So in Japan, so flexible work style and work-life balance is still not widely accepted. Traditional corporate culture in Japan prefers employees work, work strict hours, work strict hours. It's placing a lot of stress on families, especially the working mothers, who often must must decide between their career and staying home to raise children. It shouldn't have to be this way. It's a large reason why at Cybos and Kinton we encourage remote work and the flexible work hours. But still, many companies view this as losing control of their employees. A uh, lot of traditional corporate cultures are based on mistrust, letting employees decide when and where to work is based on trust and transparency between employee and employer. Uh, a lot of companies don't have this, and perhaps a company that isn't doing bad in the market doesn't feel they need to change, so they keep doing business as usual. But with all the change in the global business market, they cannot think like that forever. Many companies are already thinking ahead by creating flexible and agile company culture built on trust. Thank you, Samu and Dan. You're still with us, I hope. <laughs> oh, I am. There you are. Can you tell us why does digital digitalization demand this agile culture that both Chuck and Osamu were talking about, and how does cultural transformation lead to the adoption of technology? Well, first of all, when we start to look at, at digital transformation and we roll it on up from the, the tactical levels, which say I'm going to buy a tool or I'm going to replace an application, and uh, that's, that's part of digital transformation. Uh, when you start to roll it up and you start to look at the fact that it is both invasive and pervasive in companies, everything is changing. And that means all of the technology is going to within the next five to ten years change out. Uh, it also means that the company is going to be a very different company. And part of this is, is a direct result of where the technology is going globally and how it's creating a new type of global technoculture um, where people in, in all walks of life and at all levels in companies have access to very sophisticated technology and mobile devices and have access to very sophisticated types of applications in uh, different types of social media and social applications. We've now reached a point where people are no longer afraid of technology, but the technology outside of companies has outpaced the technology inside of companies so that people now have access in the personal lives to much greater flexibility and uh, much more uh, capability with the technology they have than they're able to find within their companies. That is a cultural change that's now coming back into the companies from outside. Um, in the past, certainly pre-1990, we found that people were absolutely afraid of the technology. and. Um, because they didn't have access to it. You know, the internet really changed everything and then mobility computing changed everything again. That type of change in, in the broader cultural sense is now being brought, as I said, back into the companies and starting to change the way that everybody looks at technology from an expectation perspective. That expectation perspective is now starting to filter back into organizations and starting to drive another level of change within the companies themselves. And a lot of people start to look at that as, as digital transformation. And while that's part of it, it it's certainly not where it needs to go. Uh, because we're now becoming at risk of creating the same type of environment that we had before that led us to 
uh, extreme complexity within the companies, hard to change applications, a lack of um, agility in our ability within companies to change. From the outside, it's now being driven in. We're starting to see that now start to filter up into to management. Uh, I had one of my clients uh, just very briefly say that they're having a difficult mm -hmm. time in hiring people because the technology, a lot of it was still as old green screen technology. And they said people just don't want to do it. So mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing that start to, to have a real impact on, on companies, on the technology use on the way they're starting to move out of older systems and into newer systems. Thank you, Dan. This next question for Chuck, and this is definitely building on Dan's response, but how is the digital world driving innovative company cultures? Oh, it's a great question. I, I, this, uh, the, the whole concept of, of self-management and, and giving people their brains back and treating people like adults at work, it's not, it's not a new thing. Uh, there were people, Mary Follett and others in the early 1900s talking about it. Bill Gore built his entire company, uh, the company that makes Gore-Tex around it. They have 10,000 people. In the 1950s, he started that company in his basement with his wife. And uh, there's, uh, there was a big movement in the late 80s, early 90s toward self-directed teams. And that failed for two reasons. One was because the management actually never changed the organizational structure to support true self-management. It was very hypocritical. We want you to pretend to be self-managed, but we're still going to manage you. But I think the bigger reason that it failed, it gets to this point that Dan's talking about, is that the technology is there today in ways that it never was. People were afraid of it before. And it's, it's there in ways today to support uh, this kind of disparate way of working from homes and, and uh, in uh, 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 flexible hours and those kinds of things that was never available in the past. And I'm convinced that the reason that the uh, participation age is racing forward and emerging work world is happening the way it is, is because companies are embracing this. And I, I could just give you scores of examples of companies that have, uh, have built their, their whole uh, organizational structure around the belief that people are smart and motivated, They're, they can trust them, they, have, they can have flexible hours, and all of this kind of stuff, and then backfill that with technology that has allowed them to continue to build relationships even when they're absent from one another. So it's, it's absolutely key to the future of this. I think it's central to the future of the way we're going to work is how we develop the technologies to support that. Excellent. Thank you, Chuck. This next question is for Osama. We're going to transition a little bit more into how to become a cultural change agent. So the question is, where does cultural change start within the organization? Is it this top-down C-suite application, or is it the more bottom-up from employees? So I'll let you go ahead and answer that, Osamu. Yes, um, actually both, I think. A lot of business managers know the strengths and weaknesses of their departments better than anyone else, there is no doubt. We have to get ideas and information from them. Uh, leaders should use this information to consider which one is best. Maybe the leader's opinion is best, but maybe not. Anyway, leaders have to see all the information to make good decision, but it's up to employees to voice opinions and share concerns. It's up to leaders to create a culture that supports uh, the, uh, this kind of transparency and feedback. So whether it's top-down or bottom-up management, it doesn't matter which one. Uh, it's integration. We gather the opinion from the bottom, uh, discuss together. Then the leader makes a decision and uh, we move from top to bottom. We use groupware like Kinton to encourage this collaboration, to share knowledge and create transparency. So Kinton helps a lot, there's no doubt. Excellent, thank you. And Dan, how do you convince people 
in your organization or your clients, I should say, that change is necessary? Well, the the, the the simple answer is you have to convince them to to their advantage to do so. Uh, as long as someone believes that the status quo is to their advantage, they're not going to change or they will resist change. So in, in selling change, which it really is, in my opinion, a sales activity, um, you really have to define why things are going to be better how they're going to be better, and how it's going to help both the, the individual as well as the company to succeed better. I think that um, you know a lot of the things that, that have happened in the past with change, especially with, with IT, have, from a, a use standpoint, um, have been poorly introduced. People have been poorly trained. And there is a, a great deal of fear with the introduction of new technologies. Um, that fear from the use of the technology. People aren't afraid to touch the technology and to use it, but afraid that they won't be immediately successful. And in a lot of companies today, um, there's, although they talk about innovation and they talk about change and a lot of things, they really aren't organized or set up to support that. Um, and so that's the type of fear that, that's being introduced. Now, where you can start to work with management, work with IT, work with the people on the floor, and start to find ways to drive out that fear, to look at the way that that organization, through the introductions of new technologies, new management approaches, are, are going to allow people more freedom but at the same point in time, not have responsibility without the authority that should go along with that responsibility. So you add the authority to do things in there. You add the way that people are now going to be uh, evaluated in their performance evaluations. And those types of changes then are really part of the foundation of moving into any type of a, a digital transformation activity. Without that foundation, it's it's tough to think that they're going to succeed. Well put, well put, Dan. And Chuck, what's your take on this? How do you convince people in an organization that change is necessary or it's not scary, it's something to be embraced, or maybe that's not even the right way of going about it? Well, yeah, I, I don't try to convince people because the I think the better, way, the better thing to do is first, Dan alluded to it, number one is data. Uh, the, the joy in this is that all the data is on the side of, of building organizations differently. I was having a, a Twitter conversation with Tom Peters, and he said, um, I never want to fly on an airplane that is created by self-managed companies. Make sure they are labeled. And that's <laughs> an emotional response. That's an emotional response. My data response was, well, the GE... Uh, Aviation division is self-managed. There are no managers in the GE Aviation Division, and they make most of the airplanes engines in the world. So you're going to have to take the bus from now. <laughs> and uh, and so the, you go with the data first. And Osamu, I mean, beautiful intro. He went from 28 percent to something like 4 percent turnover. That is astronomical cost savings. Uh, Ricardo Semler took his organization from 35% uh, turnover to 2%. Uh, Wegmans Groceries in an industry where 38% is the norm, they are at 3% turnover. Uh, you just look at, at companies that are moving forward, better technology, better communications, and a, and a whole new way of, of uh, leading rather than managing, and you find the most productive uh, best, most stable companies in the world. So number one is data, and then number two is why. And that's what I'll, I'll do with people who don't understand this stuff, is I'll ask them why they're doing what they're doing. Look at the, look at, we call it the, a friend of mine calls it the management tax. Look at the management tax on organizations. One out of seven or one out of ten people has to be a manager. And if you put people in self-managed teams, you eliminate that entire tax. That's an astronomical hmm. cost there. But we always start every conversation with why. And that's what helps us uh, work with other companies. Rather than saying you need to 
to change the way you're doing things, we would we would want to approach that with here's why. And data is part of the why, but some people will come in the altruistic door. Uh, they want a better legacy. They want to know they treated people better. Others will need to see the hard data. But uh, it, you have to have a great why. And if you don't see the importance of why, then you won't see the importance of changing. So to articulate a great why first, and then people will, will want to jump on board that. Fantastic. Articulate the great why. I like that. You know, we have a lot of people tuning in today who are definitely agents of change, um, who are in leadership roles and are personally involved in driving uh, change. So let's move on to how do we create this cultural change roadmap, a little bit more into the tactile, um, tactical things, I should say, and how we create that vision. So. You know, after you know, we ask the great why, but then let's go into the plan of how do we create the best way for clearly communicating change and new ways of working together? How do we how do we demonstrate that? And this question's for either Dan or Chuck, if you'd like to answer that. Well, I can give it a yeah, I can ahead. give it a try. And you want to go first? Chuck, Chuck? will follow. Go ahead. Okay. So. What I've found, and um, you know, is the first thing we have to do is to figure out what the end objective is. And um, you know, the the panel alluded to it earlier in kind of defining the type of company and type of environment. But aside from the the type of company and the type of environment. Um, which, which I believe can be a little bit different in different types of industries. Um, you know, when you start to talk about especially digital transformation, you have to define what that is, that box is going to look like. And then once you have an understanding of the capabilities that are going to be available, why you want to do that, you can now start to ask, well, how do we do that? And when you start looking at the how do we do that, one of the big components turns out to be people because people will make something work or make it fail. And so, you know, you need to at that point align the change that you're trying to elicit in people to the timing and to the differences that you're going to see in the evolution of the company as it moves from where it is today and mainly um, an interfaced IT world to a flexible, integrated world that, um, in my opinion, is going to be based largely on BPMS technologies in the future. The type of technologies we find, though, like a BPMS technology versus a more traditional technology, will also have a profound impact on the way people have to change and what they have to do. As an example, in a BPMS type technology base, People are expected to do models. They're expected to understand what those models mean as far as how their operations work, and then to design how things are going to change. And that's where innovation comes in with iteration and those types of things. So the type of environment that you're going to ultimately try to create will help you define what that culture has to be. And at this point, I'll, I'll, change, I'll turn it over to Chuck to uh, agree, disagree, or carry forward? No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think we have a very, I'll take it a little different direction to add to it, because uh, I think you covered all that well. Uh, when we ask, when we get with a company and help them figure out where they want to go, I think, uh, Dan, you mentioned they have to figure all this, uh, the big picture out, what is the objective that they have in mind. And before they do that, we like them to figure out what they're really good at. Because that can actually, it'll either guide where they end up, or if they don't like what they're really good at, it'll cause them to, to hit some change buttons. So there's four very simple questions we have for companies when asking them to create a vision for where they want to go. Number one is, what are we really good at right now? What are we really good at? And include the bad things that you're good at. We're good at high turnover. We're good at low productivity. But you know, focus on the on the good stuff as well, and make a list of all that, and codify it down to the few things that you really think you're best at. And then the second question is why? Why are we so good at those things? 
And that's when you begin to uncover what companies actually believe, and that's where their culture lies. People too often ask uh, companies to, to express their culture in some vision statement, when in reality their culture is best expressed by simply looking at who they actually are, what they actually do on a regular daily basis. So why are we so good at doing these things? And then question number three is, do we like being good at these things or do we want to be good at something else? If we don't like it, we have to change. And then the fourth one really isn't a question, it's, a, it's a, an application. If we want a different result, we need to believe something different. We need to identify the right beliefs to get the right results. And, and, and really this is why consulting doesn't work in so many cases because we go in to change, to engineer a result by changing out an assembly line or putting in a digital uh, product or something like that and nothing really changes. I think Dan, somewhere in your writing, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I saw that you know, it's not about digital transformation. It's not, it's not about bringing in a new piece of software by itself. It's about uh, software supporting a culture and supporting a, a way of doing business and the, and the digital transformation is a piece of that and that's where it breaks down as we go in and, and try and put in new software like we put in new assembly lines and uh, nothing, weren't, nothing runs differently because we didn't really fix the cultural issues first. So I, I'd, I'd start with that. Excellent. You know, I'm going to kind of jump ahead here because I think we answer a lot of other questions around um, just embracing continuous change, and that just comes from, you know, showing, um, not telling how your culture exemplifies uh, different important facets of your organization, not just writing it down in a mission statement um, as you had expressed, Chuck. So this next question is for Dan, and it's about designing our culture then. Um, so as work culture, digital transformation, we're seeing this connection. Um, and also a lot of IT decisions, technology buying decisions, are leaving the IT department as we talked that our world is just being disrupted by new digital and technology tools. And line of business managers are feeling uh, more empowered to seek out their own solutions. So Dan, I want to ask you, uh, who should be leading this effort? Should it come from IT, or should it be more operations-led, or maybe both? Well, it needs to be collaborative, first of all. Um, second of all, I, I think that those companies that allow um, the different divisions to just go off on their own are going to find themselves in a world of pain. Um, that's not to say that IT has to be responsible for everything, but in what... Um, you know, I'm proposing as the one of the initial steps in digital transformation is to figure out the architecture of the future. In the past, all the new applications, all the new technology, it's just kind of been shoved together and interfaced. And what we've created is an unbelievable complexity. It's a complexity that we almost can't deal with. And we need to avoid that in the future. So we need a set architecture and that's a technology architecture, and it needs to deal with, first of all, the hardware and the middleware and the operating systems and all that type of thing to make sure that it all fits together. Then within that context, we need standards. Now, once we have those standards in place to make sure that everything that we, we, we buy, build, whatever, will fit together in an integrated manner, we can now then allow other organizations within the company outside of IT to to take the steps that they're starting to take now. But if, if that's not brought under control right away, we're just going to recreate all the problems that we have today and our digital transformation is going to fail. Hmm. Hmm. So, so collaboration so it, is it, a big is a big piece. It it is and you know the responsibility for it I think can shift over time. But it, it needs to right now as an initial step, be centralized within IT. And then once mm -hmm. those standards are built, um, we have that organization, that framework, that architecture that we're moving towards. At that point, just so things fit into that architecture the right way is really all that's going to be um, necessary. So at that point, it can be distributed. Mm -hmm. But right, so, whatever you do, yeah. mm -hmm. whatever you do is, is going to have a, which, you know, whichever approach you take and however you do that, 
it's going to have a direct cultural implication because as things first of all move to more collaboration between IT and business which today there are still chasms all over the place but as as those start to become more collaborative and become closer together the methods become more integrated between business methodologies and IT methodologies the culture and the way that the worker and the manager interact with IT and the way that IT becomes embedded is going to cause a tremendous knowledge shift and culture shift in the way that these people have to work together. Hmm. Hmm. Excellent. So designing the culture, there's a lot of components there and um, there's a couple handouts if you look in your control pane um, under the handout section with some more tips on you know, designing this digital, this change roadmap. Um, there's one from Dan Morris about digital transformation. Another excellent handout, actually a chapter of um, Chuck's book on why employees are always a bad idea. And then the slide, the graph, the chart from Osamu showing some more details about the turnover rates and how Cybozu got to 4%. Uh, within a few years. So just want to offer up those as additional resources as we transition into this last question. And of course, um, it's not going to be the prettiest bow to tie it all together because there's still lots of messy parts and we're all trying to figure this out and it's different for every company, it's different for um, every industry. But in the best way possible, you know, we have gone to great lengths or um, really invested in nurturing a culture. What can we do to protect it? What can we do to uh, ensure there's lasting change, if there's even such a thing? So maybe I'll start with Osamu for answering this question. Hey. So I think by not not focusing on being the market winners, but instead focusing on the employee and creating teamwork. It creates the dedication we need for our companies to be successful and thrive in a changing landscape. I think we've been doing a great job. I don't think we're successful yet, but so far our culture has been working. But, but uh, we're still too small to make an impact to their society. We are still far from being the greatest team or company in the world. It's a challenging we continue to pursue, so there's no doubt. Thank you. Thank you, Osamu. And Chuck, maybe I'll let you go ahead and step up for this. Yeah, I, I think we have this phrase, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> And what we mean by that is that uh, we don't want to rest on our laurels. We don't want to think we have ever arrived. Uh, I like uh, Osamu's view of not being the best yet, not being great yet. We're never far enough along. So we, we, that's a part of our culture. We're always thinking about how we can continue to improve. And in that context, uh, change really does become our constant. I know that's a trite saying. But uh, Apple destroyed all its great products along the road because they knew if, if they didn't destroy those products, somebody else would. And I think that's a great uh, way to continue to make sure that you you uh, you sir, you keep a good culture is that you continue to be willing to change with everything that comes along. And then uh, probably in a, on a more practical basis, we get everyone involved in designing the changes around motivating whys and making sure that there's there's uh, a, a buy-in and an ownership by everyone on how to how to how to uh, change and why to change and on a macro level I think the one thing that will keep this uh, going in the right direction is the the data itself the data on on uh, on uh, transforming cultures and organizations in the direction of an emerging work world is just too compelling and eventually it's going to win out on its own. But in the meantime, be paranoid and expect that change is, is the constant and be willing, and, and not just be willing, but embrace it on a regular basis. Mm. Thank you, Chuck. So stay, stay paranoid. <laughs> I like that. And Dan, if you can please give us your perspective on what we can do to create 
a lasting I, change or perpetual change? I, I think that the, you know, um, one of the statements that uh, came out of uh, Deming was to drive fear out. Uh, we, we have to get back to, and we've lost it, but we have to get back to where people trust their companies, where they trust management, where they care. Uh, with the downsizing that's gone on with everything that's happened in the last 15 years, there's there's been a, a great deal of eroding as far as uh, loyalty is concerned. People jump jobs for any reason constantly. And I, I think that, that part of that is, you know, there's a lack of trust um, between management and the, the staff. There is an animosity in a lot of companies between the business operation, production, and, and IT. And we have to, to collaborate and we have to work together to break down those barriers because only when we can do that and we can start to have truly collaborative teams that trust one another and you know have the performance information to allow them to iterate and to look at change creatively. And until we have that, that trust, um, we're, we're going to have problems with both business transformation as well as digital transformation. So that's where I would start, is to build that relationship, to build that trust between management and, and staff. Excellent. Thank you all very much for your thoughtful contribution to this conversation. And I know we are running just a little short on time. So I thought at least take one question which has already been submitted. Um, and any other questions that you have, please feel free to send them my way. My email is Nicole at Kintone.com. I will make sure they get to um, the right panelists to answer that. But why don't we go ahead and just take um, this one question real quick, which I think uh, is very important to um, to include. And this is, how does company culture, and this is from Michael, how does company culture and digital transformation vary from industry to industry? It's not, this sounds like a Dan question, if I'm, if I'm right. Dan, would you like to take this one on? Yeah. Um, you know, it, it varies uh, from industry to industry. As an example, the, the culture in an insurance company is different than the culture in a manufacturing company. And it, because they're doing different types of things where, um, you know, you have production facilities, you have people building things, you have front office, uh, a little bit of back office, not a lot, but you have you know, that's one type of a culture. The systems, the applications, uh, where you have, you know, uh, ERPs directing how things are built and that type of thing gives you a, a certain type of a, a culture. When you start to look more at what we'll call knowledge workers um, in an insurance company, that changes completely uh, from division to division under different types of management where you have different expectations of people. They're working on different things. Uh, you can have culture changes there. The culture, to some degree, is a reflection, and this is just backwards, but the culture, to some degree, is a reflection of the application that the companies have, because the applications, when you purchase, especially when you purchase an application, you modify your business operation to take advantage of the capabilities of that purchased application, which then changes your operation, which then, in fact, then gives you a lot of changes to the way culture has to work from, you know, you're not worried, as an example, in manufacturing, I'm worried about scrap. I'm worried about those types of things. Well, in insurance, I'm not worried about scrap, but I am worried about rework. How many times do I have to touch the same plane to get it done? The way you look at performance because of that changes. And the way that that performance then ties into people's activities on a daily basis drives cultural change. Because if you're going to be, as an example, um, one of the things that we did, we put in to change the culture. We had people have to what we call kill a shark a day. And a shark was a problem. Up until then, 
people just kind of went along and they didn't really care. They kind of dealt with these things. And so we were changing the culture by trying to get them to, to recognize problems and to start to fix those problems. And so there were incentive systems and things that we put in place for that. But the, you know, the, the bottom line is that you have to look at what people are doing, how they're doing it, the support they're doing, and then the impact of that on their performance and how they're going to be measured because that drives a lot of culture. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, any questions that went unanswered, I will be sure that they um, are forwarded to the right panelists. So um, any other questions that pop up, don't hesitate to reach out. Again, my email is Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, at Kintone.com. All right, so before we leave, just wanted to tell you about our digital transformation newsletter with some great interviews, advice, and practices from leaders and industry experts to help you on your journey. So you can just click on the link in the chat box to sign up. Um, you can also join by going to resources.kintone.com slash dtnews. I'll also be following up with you in an email um, in the next 24 hours with a link so you can view this recording. And also it will include a couple of handouts to give you some more food for thought. Again, one is by Dan Morris. There's another from Chuck Blakeman. It's a chapter from his book, Why Employees Are Always a Bad Idea, an excellent book. And the third is a PowerPoint presentation um, by Osamu that just breaks down um, and talks about how Cybozu drastically lowered its turnover rate. So that's all I have. Thank you so very much for joining us again, and hope to see you again. Thanks, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye now.